John Lewins, uh, CEO of K92 Mining uh, Inc, TSX uh, listed company. So we operate the, the high grade K92 mine in Papua New Guinea. It's one of the highest grade mines in the world. Uh, just come off a record quarter, record year. Um, and in the process of expanding our operation from the current 100,000 ounces plus per annum to 350,000 ounces or thereabouts by 2025. John, it's good to see you, sir. Um, I know you've been off on a big, long, um, worldwide uh, road trip uh, and uh, just, just got back home in the past few days. So I appreciate you making the time to uh, speak to us today. Uh, saw the announcement this morning with regards to the fourth quarter and annual financial results. Not a bad year. Well, I, I think uh, when you consider that this has been another year that's been heavily impacted by COVID, um, our whole industry, uh, there's very few people that have managed to not have some significant impact from it. When you look at that and see what we've achieved over the last 12 months, uh, you know, fair to say we're extremely uh, uh, happy with, with where we've got to. I bet. Um, when, you, when you give some of the, the headline numbers that we should be uh, looking at? Well, if we take the fourth quarter to uh, as, a, um, as a lead-in, if you like, we commissioned our stage two expansion last year, which doubled throughput from 200,000 tonnes per annum to 400,000 tonnes per annum. And so when you see the fourth quarter, you see that we basically achieved our expanded throughput, 99,713 tonnes. So we basically achieved that, uh, that expansion. That resulted in record gold production of uh, just over 36,000 ounces gold equivalent, which is over 20% above anything we've achieved previously. At the same time, our cash cost for the quarter, $456 an ounce gold, and all in sustaining cost of 672 per ounce gold. And we also, in that quarter, brought, our, uh, brought out our first stolt material from the, from the new Judd vein. And we also commissioned a new gravity circuit. So that was the fourth quarter. And that put the cap on a, on a quite exceptional year. Record annual tonnage, 300, over 336,000 tons. So that's a 46% increase from 2020. Record annual production, uh, a bit over 104,000 ounces gold equivalent. And Cash costs for the year, $614 an ounce gold, all in sustaining cost, $856. So we actually beat our updated guidance, which was $670, $720 cash and $920 to $970 gold. And remember that these costs are being achieved in an operation that we are actually in the process of expanding and they'll get better. It's a very efficient machine uh, that you've got going there. And, and I think all the more impressive, given that it's been um, achieved during a time where COVID restrictions has affected Papua New Guinea uh, greatly. Um, so, but the, there's the road for you, well, actually, first question is, have you given guidance um, for this year in terms of you know, what you're looking to achieve in terms of answers uh, or, or other numbers? Yeah, we've given guidance for this year of 115 to 140,000 ounces. It's a, it's a relatively wide guidance, and that's really um, driven by still allowing for some impact of COVID. Uh, if COVID wasn't there, we'd probably be guiding 120 to, 125 to 140. But with COVID still sitting there, we're still, still giving uh, uh, quite a wide guidance. I'd make the point, I think, uh, last year, we, we would say we lost uh, production-wise about 20,000 ounces due to COVID. And at the same time, we had direct costs associated with dealing with COVID. So that is um, extended rosters, quarantining, uh, all the testing that you've got to do, all of those sort of things, around about $60 an ounce. So the costs that were achieved last year were achieved with an impost of about $60 an ounce from direct COVID costs. 
So t- tell me this, right? Because it, it, there's an expectation from the market that this machine works, right? You, you're lower, you continue to lower costs. You're finding, uh, higher grades. Um, there are, uh, you know, record thicknesses. We, you know, we've seen, we've seen the headlines. It's still, you're, you're in production, but there's still a massive, uh, development and exploration component to this. So how do you tell the growth story now that you've kind of got this cornerstone? Of the of the production there, how do you make sure that people perceive you as more than just a, a producer? With you know, typically would be perceived as being um, you know a, a modest growth and maybe the odd dividend thrown in. Where's the blue sky in this story? Well, we're um, we're busy with uh, the definitive feasibility study in the PA on what we call our stage three expansion, which takes us up to one point two million tons per annum. Um, this year, however, we will undertake what we call our stage 2A expansion, which increases our throughput by 25%. So increases production from 400,000 ton per annum to 500,000 tons per annum. And so that means um, 25% increase in production as well. So next year, we'll be, we'll be looking something like uh, 150,000 answers. So that uh, stage 2A will be commissioned by fourth quarter of uh, this year. And we will, we've effectively already started the stage three uh, expansion. We're busy with the twin incline. It's over a kilometer in now. Um, and we're busy with quite a, a number of areas, expansion of the camp, uh, putting in a, a brand new workshop up at the 800 portal. We've got a 700 meter um, raise bore going in for our vent shaft uh, fourth quarter of this year five meter diameter so there's a lot of work going on a lot of work already committed to this stage three expansion and that's 1.2 million tons per annum so if you look at it from today it's a it's a threefold increase in throughput and we anticipate that that's going to going to lead to production um 300 350,000 ounces a year it'll obviously drive down our our cash costs are all in sustaining costs. Um, the original PA we did at a million tons per annum had an NPV five of one point five billion at fifteen hundred dollars an ounce gold and and three dollars a pound copper. And I think most people would be saying they are pretty conservative numbers for gold and copper. So we certainly anticipate that uh, we'll see a project that'll look uh, something better than that. Um, we just announced our updated Cora resource, our maiden Judd resource. Cora, big focus had been on um, increasing our measured and indicated resource to feed into a definitive feasibility study. So we had, basically we had a million ounces of measured and indicated. Target was to get that to two. And in fact, we got uh, 2.3 million ounces of measured and indicated. And then there's another 2.6 million ounces of inferred. So um, we've actually increased the number of answers we've got during a period where we've actually produced 200,000 answers. So um, given that the majority of our focus was actually on increasing our measure and indicated, we still increased the resource. This year, big focus um, on underground drilling where we got six rigs, we'll be actually on expanding that resource. And when we look at um, where we're sitting right now, Judd bit over 300,000 ounces, but we've only drilled out 20% of the area within the mining lease that is covered by Cora, and it's a parallel system to Cora. So clearly a lot of potential to expand Judd. Um, when we look outside of the mining lease, we've just completed the first ever drilling in what we call um, Cora Judd South. So it's going to the south of the existing mining lease, where what we've uh, what we said is that that the modelling says that the the vein system, the core uh, vein system, ex- extends about a kilometre to the south, and we now also say that the Judd system should extend about a kilometre to the south. And when you think that within the mining lease we have a kilometre, we're basically saying we think the strike length doubles. Um, 
the proof of the pudding, as they say, is in the is in the eating. So that's fine to say that. We've reported the first two holes that we've drilled to the south, 75 meters and 150 meters to the south. So we're doing a series of fence lines going to the south. And both of those holes, we would say, came in with uh, better results than we anticipated. If we look at the, the first hole, 75 meters, a long strike, we went through not one, but two Judd veins, uh, 1.3 meters over 16 grams and 0.9 meters over 15. So better than average for Judd. And then in Cora, we went through K1, 0.9 at 36 grams per ton, K2, 6.2 at 17. So already that's better than average for Cora. But then we also encountered K3, 5 meters at 8 grams per ton. So the hole delivered more than we expected. And added to that, the K2, K3 were actually a dilatant zone where we had almost 36 meters at 6 grams per ton, gold equivalent. 80% of that value was actually copper. So this is very, very copper rich. The core of two of those veins, a meter over 20% copper. Um, I never thought I'd say it, but I've actually seen sexy drill core when you see something like that. So that was the first hole. 75 meters further along strike, um, we drilled a second hole. That hole, uh, the disappointing thing was we lost the hole after going through Judd, so we didn't get into Cora. But Judd, um, one vein, 2.9 meters at 8.5 grams per ton, so that's about average for it. Second vein, 15 meters at almost 16 grams per ton, well above average. So from the Judd perspective, really uh, exciting result. And then you also had a dilatant zone incorporating those two veins where you had 66 and a half meters at five grams per ton and about 30% of that value was copper. Um, that makes it a really exciting hole, but just to add a little bit more, uh, 75 meters to the east, we encountered a vein that we have never seen before, three and a half meters at a bit over 10 grams per ton gold equivalent. And it's in a plane that we've never drilled before. So there's a whole new vein system potentially opening up there as well. Now, when you look at those, those uh, they're only the first two holes, but both of those holes have an endowment of metal, which is four times what we see within the mining lease, if you look at it on a 100 by 100 meter uh, square, for instance. And so there's certainly um, a lot of indications that, that there is a, a huge endowment of metal. Um, we expected to see higher copper as we go to the south because that's going towards the, the porphyry, uh, which is believed to be the source of all of this mineralization. Um, so, yeah, right now um, we've got a rig up there. We just put a second rig up there and we've got a third rig going up in the third quarter. So growth, quite frankly, um, will be the name of the game this year as well as expanding production it's, it sounds like because I, I, I was intrigued by the um that you've answered a lot of the questions there so thanks for that in terms of core south and and and, and judd south uh, well and, and judd two for that matter there's um we've talked in the past about um Karempe. it's a slightly different it's not the same extension but it's pretty close by is there plans to do any any drilling on that Karempe, uh you know, where we had, I think the best result was uh, three and a half meters at 15 grams per ton plus is a secondary target right now to Cora South and Judd South. Um, and it says something about the endowment that it, that it is. But the the great thing of, of Cora and Judd is that all the development that we do underground sits between Cora and Judd and they're about 150 meters apart. So they have an immediacy for our development and we, hence we're extending um, Judd and Cora to the south. I'd also point out as the twin incline comes in, we'll also be looking to extend them both at depth as well. Right. Okay. So you had, I'm, I'm really intrigued by this because if, if I go, because 
it, it, it's an amazing uh, company and the way that it's been put together because you have to have a team that deals with the operational side of things and and hits consistently. You've set yourself some uh, ag- aggressive targets there and they, I say there's an assumption because you've been doing it efficiently that you'll continue to do it efficiently you know, and, and increase the numbers, right? So that that's one team. Then you've got your development team in terms of delivering, you know, uh, stage two, two A and, and, and three. And obviously we're, as you explained, you're already well into stage three planning there. And, and you know, having that team operating efficiently in a, an environment where we're seeing inflation hit uh, numbers across the board, and I, and I suspect PNG is not immune to that. Um, and then the exploration um, side of things. You're producing, so there's a lot of going on, but there's a lot of money being thrown off in this environment. Producers are reaping the rewards um, of a, you know, a high gold uh, price environment. Does your planning, does your timing stay exactly the same? Do you, does it give you courage, to perhaps, and a bit more conviction to accelerate things? I mean, how, how, do you, how do you treat the cash flow? When we look at our expansions, we funded all of our expansions internally. And we plan to continue to do that in the main part. So um, the so-called holy grail of expansion without dilution Um with the metal prices where they are, of course, that gives us more confidence. Uh, we do expect to see, obviously, increases in CapEx for the project. It's been seen, as you say, across the industry, there's been some pretty significant uh, escalation in prices. And, and we expect to see that with this project as well within the DFS. But despite that, we still see that our cash flow will be sufficient to actually be able to build this project from our own cash flows from the uh, from the operation and at the same time also fund exploration and I'd point out I think last last year we were the largest explorer in Papua New Guinea this year again we'll be the largest explorer in Papua New Guinea and I think we'll be spending about 15 million US dollars on uh, on exploration um, in addition to spending something like 90 million on capex and that's sustaining capex that's the twin incline um, that's expansion capital, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, we were the second highest taxpayer in the in the mining space last year in PNG as well. Um, hence, in a meeting I had with the with the prime minister in the first quarter, uh, PM's office put out a press release uh, noting I think it was K ninety two, good corporate citizen and flagging that. Uh, how much tax we'd be paying, and that even while we're expanding, we still continue to pay corporate tax. So corporate tax, you know, salary withholding tax, et cetera, et cetera. The important one for the, uh, for the government is the corporate tax, the fact that we're making a profit and we are contributing. Yeah, we, I mean, we've, we've talked a lot about that. That we did a, a great show on on ESG, you know, what what it means and what you guys are doing in, in, in terms of it being all pervasive throughout the entire company, not just a department or individual. So I think that's a good good session. And, and it, it might be worth putting the link below um, to that to understand what's what you've been doing there. But um let me let me go to the kind of the corporate register because you're covered by a lot of institutions uh now. So you know a lot a lot of the big banks now. And it, you know it's all positive in terms of you know the, the you know what, what what they're saying about the future for, for you. But when you when you don't need to come to the market for Cash for projects. Um, you've, you've, we've talked about M and A in, in, in the past, and we, we know your position on that. But when you don't need to go to the market for capital, do you? What's the best way to play this in terms of the makeup of, of the share register for your company? Is it well? We should be aiming to be predominantly institutionally held, um, and if so, do you start looking at the types of institutions that you want to be held by? And then what what does that do? for share price and trading in the context of this is still a growth story. So h- how do you play that dynamic? Okay, well, first off, I think we're covered by about 14 analysts, which which makes it the highest in our sector, um, which I think uh, tells you something about, about the assets and, and about the company. And remember, we are, of course, the recipient of the Thayer Lindsley Award, still the holder of the Thayer Lindsley Award, for the best global discovery from PDAC. 
Um, so the quality of Cora and and the work that went into uh, to finding it are um, are well recognised. When we look at our institutional shareholder base, um, it's it's full of the people that you'd really want from North America, 1832, RBC, Fidelity, um, Donald Smith, uh, Equinox, the list goes on. Um, we are very North American centric. One of the things that we have been uh, uh, working at is, is expanding our institutional uh, shareholder base into Europe, uh, Asia, Australia. So we have, we've had some success there. Um, recent conference, we were talking to a number of our existing shareholders out of, uh, out of uh, Paris, out of Geneva, out of London, um, out of Australia. So we have um, expanded our um, institutional shareholder base. Um, and obviously on the retail side, it's it's really dominated by uh, North American, primarily ca Canadian, but uh, we've got quite a substantial U.S. retail shareholder base as well. Um, we think we've got the right mix right now, um, but of course uh, the main thing really is you just got to keep delivering. And um, I, I'd make the point that for the last best part of two years, our focus has not been on expanding the resource. It has been on expanding our measure and indicated, and that has now pivoted. And therefore this year, I believe you'll see a significant increase in our resource because that's where our focus is going to be. And uh, we'll certainly be looking at putting out an updated Cora resource, uh, probably first quarter of next year, updated Judd resource, first quarter of next year. And effectively, um, right now, we've got two surface rigs and four underground rigs working on expanding that resource. That'll go up to three surface rigs, four underground rigs working on expanding the resource. So we, we believe we'll see a significant increase in the, uh, in the resource. Um, and we, in uh, November, December last year, we flew the most the largest uh, aerial geophysics program that's been flown in PNG for over 15 years and the most advanced that's ever been flown. And the results out of that are really, really exciting. Um, we have generated so many more targets within our 800 and something square kilometers of mining and exploration uh, leases. So um, we are going to have to balance Exploration expenditure with expansion expenditure. There is no doubt on that, even with these uh, high metal prices, because we could we could spend a lot of money on uh, on exploration with the number of targets that we have. Can you explain? I think there's a really important point that you made. Okay, and I'm glad you went there. Um, which is the, the the not the move away, but the the added emphasis on the expansion and exploration. And who you're doing that for? Because focusing on the MI has been fantastic um, in the sense that you know people understand the, the, the quality of that work body. But this needs to get bigger and needs to get bigger for a reason. And it might be worth sort of, you know, sort of explaining the strategy, why you've done it in that in the order that you have and what outcome you're looking for. The strategy in the first instance was to was to achieve throughput, bring us up into commercial production as quickly as possible, which we which we pretty much achieved in four months of Cora. We quickly recognized that we had something exceptional, the continuity in terms of strike, in terms of hit rate of drilling, et cetera, was quite exceptional. So we could see we had uh, a quite exceptional deposit. So the next question was how quickly could we maximize the value of that? And maximizing the value for us, um, we saw very quickly meant expansion expansion of the existing plant where we recognized we had an opportunity to double throughput, double production. And so we, on the back of a PEA, we doubled the expansion of the plant, only $15 million. So it was, it was a relatively low cost and continued 
to expand the resource while we expanded that uh, existing plant with the idea that we would then go to the next stage of expansion. And that next stage turned out to be a, a 1 million ton per annum. Um, so we got to that point. The figures were quite outstanding, 1.5 billion NPV5 um, for an outlay of 125 million um, and then a sustaining capital during the period of another 115, so 240 being spent over that period. So that, that gave us a project that also showed that we could fund it totally internally. And so we took that to a feasibility study while we completed our expansion to 400,000 tonnes per annum. And, and there were quite a number of people who said, why bother? Why bother doing the 400,000 tonnes per annum? Just go out and build, you know, just go out and drill, do your definitive feasibility study, build the, the, the million. Well, the answer to that in part is that with that expansion, of course, we now don't need debt. We don't need to raise equity because we generate enough cash flow to be able to build this next phase. And in fact, the next phase will be 1.2 million rather than a million. Even there, when we've looked at it, we've recognized that we have one kilometer of potentially two kilometers of strike length that we've drilled. And we don't know how deep this deposit goes as yet because every hole we've drilled at depth has hit mineralization, commercial grade and thickness. So we're, we still don't know how big it is, but we are pretty confident it's bigger than what's there right now. So we committed very early to the next phase, which is a twin incline, but that twin incline if we committed it at 1.2 million tons per annum, it would be a certain size. And when we looked at what we had, we said, well, what's the chances of this remaining at 1.2 million tons per annum, given what we know, um, relatively low. So we'll put in a twin incline that will allow for a stage three, a stage four, and a stage five, potentially. So rather than 1.2 million tons per annum, it could go up to potentially 5 million tons per annum with, with a conveyor system and we've done some prelim work on it. So we've allowed for significant expansion beyond that which we're doing in stage three based on our understanding of the geology, based on where we see the potential of the deposit. Now, the, one of the challenges for us is to get the market to see that, as, as I think you were alluding to. Because, you know, you're concerned when you've got the quality of deposit that, that we've got. And remember, this is for a 5 million ounce under, underground resource. It's about the third highest grade in the world. So this is quite an exceptional deposit. Your concern is that people in the industry, geologists, mining engineers, et cetera, can see the quality and therefore can see the potential and can see more value than the market can see because the market sees based on resource, based on the, the, the main measurables that you can put out, whereas industry can see beyond that. And so big concern for us was to make sure that we got as much information into the market, that we put as much um, knowledge there that could recognize the potential of the deposit so that we would get the recognition in the market so that we weren't in a position where perhaps our, our shareholders wouldn't see what people in the industry could see. And uh, we could end up with uh, some M&A um, action that we didn't want to put it away. It, it, it's kind of interesting to me because I've, I've, where I wanted to go with that conversation was you know, some of the M&A activity that's happened over the last sort of, I'm going to say six months. Um, it's very striking that what the mid tiers and, and, and large companies are looking for in, in a business. And if you look at the kind of North American acquisitions, valuations comparable to yours without any revenue. Right. Um, so those are the size of deals that are that are, are are getting done. Those are sorts of valuations being attributed there. You've got the cash flow, but perhaps are you having to work that little bit extra harder because of I don't know. There's a kind of overseas or a PNG discount being applied, um, and does that help you in a way in terms of making you defensible because you've had to choose a model which 
which you've gone for, which is let's get some revenue flowing quickly to negate the need for raising capital in the market, which may make you susceptible to a, a, a takeover bid. Look, I think, um, first of all, um, wherever jurisdiction you are in the world, you have your challenges. Um, PNG has its challenges. West Africa has its challenges. Uh, Canada, British Columbia. Um, I'd far rather try and get a, a mining permit or a mining license in PNG than I would in British Columbia, for instance. But it's not a it's not about what the challenge is. It's about how you manage it. You've got to recognise where your challenges are, and you've got to manage them. And, and so that's where I think we've been very successful. I believe we've been successful is that we've managed, we've understood where our risks are, and we've actively worked to manage those uh, to manage those risks. And I think that has been recognised in the market, but I would say that there is still a discount for for PNG, which obviously we are in PNG, Papua New Guinea, and and, and we believe that uh, that uh, discount or however you want to put it is is um, unreasonable, if you like. But at the same time, you know what you the moment you start riling against the market and saying the market is wrong, you know. The market ultimately gets to where it gets to, and you're in it. You're part of it. You, all you can do is work within the constraints that you have. Uh, and I think we've been able to do that relatively well. I do believe that COVID has given us an opportunity to cement our position in terms of production, in terms of completion of a definitive feasibility study, and, and really put some runs on the board. Um, over the last two years, we have commissioned an expansion which has doubled our throughput in PNG um, with our own people. Every cubic meter of concrete that was thrown, we produced ourselves. The steelwork that was put in was all put in by ourselves or put in by PNG companies. So we've done it very much in house and, um, and we've delivered. So, uh, you know, it's given us an opportunity while, um, you know, people aren't able, haven't been able to perhaps look at those M&A type things uh, as aggressively as they may have uh, without COVID there. So that's been an advantage to us, I, I would say. Right. I, I, I guess that goes somewhere to answering the question because I, because you know, Management teams have their own views about what what an exit looks like. You know, if indeed they're looking for one, or is their company defensible from you know uh, an unwanted or uh, bid uh, coming in? But it also helps retail investors, which you need because you want that kind of liquidity of trading of, of stock, to understand what type of investment they're they're looking into. Because at one point eight billion. You sometimes those companies get, you know, grouped as one, as sort of steady growth um, type stories, as opposed to the companies that perhaps want to continue to be a a, a growth a growth story with, you know, some some way to run and some ability of control to be able to deliver th- their plan without, you know, someone coming along and perhaps r- ruining your uh, good intent. So um, I'm, I'm always intrigued by how the markets and the jurisdictions shape the management's ability to deliver their plan. Um, it, it, I mean, it shapes it in the in that context, but it also shapes it in terms of, you know, where is, what's your value? Um, put this asset in Western Australia, fifty mm, percent more in market cap. Um, that's uh, perhaps the sort of uh, discount that that we see, um, and. As I said, we, we would see it as, as probably um, unjustified, certainly in the when you look at the history of Papua New Guinea and all the rest of it. But um, you deal with uh, you deal with what you have. The, the other side of the coin is, quite frankly, the opportunity for a junior company to have what is effectively a tier one asset. There are almost no junior companies around that that have these type of assets. So the opportunity that PNG has provided is for us to um, effectively acquire or identify a T1 asset because the, the geology in the country is incredible. It is, it is, in my view, second to none. 
and the endowment that we have in our leases is uh, is among the best in PNG. So the opportunity we have is as a junior company being able to acquire this and then put the money in to show that what you actually have is is among the best in the world. So just just on the exchanges again, I want to stick with this, this share register and makeup. Obviously, you're on the TSX and you're um, OTCQX. We've mentioned the Australian Australian gold companies tend to do quite well in terms of, of valuations, but it's predominantly a, a retail environment because there's not that many institutions. Is what your plan in terms of you know tri- driving um, you know liquidity and trading? Are you going to be leaning a little bit more heavily towards North America, in which case is OTCQX um, going to be fit for purpose, or would you look to maybe even main board it down there? Look, at this point in time, we are happy with where we are on the uh, the full board of the TSX um, and that ability in, uh, in the US as well. Um, we have an exceptional institutional shareholder base right now. Um, We've certainly uh, looked at enhancing our ability to also um, interact, communicate with the retail sector because it's an an important sector, it's an important sector of uh, of value. So we have um, also looked at that. I'd make the point as well that TSX probably values P&G more highly than the ASX when you look at ASX companies in Papua New Guinea versus ourselves as a TSX company in Papua New Guinea. I would say right now that TSX um, probably uh, values companies in PNG um, more highly. And maybe that's because there are, and we do have uh, Barrick, we have ourselves. Um, having said that, ASX have got Newcrest, you got St. Barbara. So, um, I've, I think we've we've been able to c- communicate the the great potential that we have, the great potential the country has, um, well in that uh, in that Canadian market, and and it's a very receptive market. I think we've found. Uh, it seems like John. I mean, I think you're you're up from what about six ninety when we last spoke to eight twenty one today. So. Uh, they're listening. Uh, you're delivering. Uh, well done on the Q4 and the annual results uh, for 2021. Um, keep it going and stay in touch. Thanks for that.